Welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the show for crypto natives. Every week, we do short but in-depth conversations with the most important builders and investors in crypto, so you can filter through what's noise and stay ahead of the markets. I'm your host, Jason Choi. Nothing on this show should be construed as financial advice, and my guests, myself, and my employer may hold positions and assets discussed on the show. Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsors, Nexo, Radix, and Bittrex. Stick around to learn more. Now, if you're an investor in Ethereum or you're part of the DeFi community, you're probably really excited because this week or last week, by the time this episode actually comes out, was monumental for all of crypto, especially for Ethereum. While Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal were busy reporting on Bitcoin breaking all-time high in price, Ethereum 2.0 finally rolled out its phase zero. This is arguably a much more important event as it signals the transition of Ethereum from its current state to a more scalable future that can support more applications and prepare for actual mass adoption. So to join us to explain just what is being upgraded, the implications of this transition, the traction so far, and some of the key challenges coming up for Ethereum are Ryan Watkins and Wilson Withiam, analysts from Asari, a research and data company. But before we get to that, let's hear from our sponsor, Nexo. Today's episode is brought to you by the good folks from Nexo. In this crisis, many investors aim to keep and grow their digital assets. Others seek to maximize the yield on their cash. Nexo allows you to achieve exactly these two goals. The company offers instant crypto credit lines against all major cryptocurrencies with interest rates starting from only 5.9% APR. Nexo also lets you earn up to 8% annually on your fiat and digital assets. What's more, Interest is paid out daily. That means you can add or withdraw your funds at any time. So get started today at Nexo.io. And hey, everybody, I'm super excited to have Ryan and Wilson from the Masari research team on here to talk about one of the biggest topics in crypto right now, and that is Ethereum 2.0. Now, just to give a little bit of context for those of you who don't know, Masari is a data and research company in crypto that I have been following since their very early days as a happy and paying user. And recently, Ryan and Wilson put together a massive report on Ethereum 2.0 that spans, I think, over 60 pages, so incredibly detailed. And I'm very excited to be able to pick Ryan and Wilson's brain on this specific topic. So guys, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Happy to be here. Awesome. So just to get us started, guys, you wrote this massive report on Ethereum 2.0. So can you give us maybe a little history about just how did this idea of Ethereum 2.0 came to be? Why can't we just stick to the Ethereum that was launched in 2016? And either of you guys feel free to you know start with this. Uh, I guess high level, you know, why does Ethereum 2.0 need to exist and why is it needed now? So uh, I think there's you know one major problem with Ethereum today, and it's that it doesn't scale. And we've seen the impacts of that and the effects of that both in 2017 when we had that massive ICO run, uh, and then you know, Crypto Kitties ended up uh, pushing Ethereum to its limits. And we've also seen that recently with the rise of DeFi and just the boom in economic activity has taken place in Ethereum in you know the back half of 2020. That uh, Ethereum just simply can't scale today, and it's created a you know really. Uh, challenging user experience for for many people because transaction times will be slow, uh, transaction fees will be high. So uh, basically, what Ethereum 2.0 is is a way of addressing the scalab- scalability issue. One, uh, and then two, it's also a way of increasing Ethereum's uh, security, uh, as well as it's also a major upgrade to ETH, uh, the asset, by adding this on uh, a staking component. Um, so that's kind of like high level overview of, you know, what Ethereum is or where, where Ethereum has come from and kind of like why Ethereum is needed today. And I'll let Wilson kind of explain some more backstory on uh, kind of the road to E2 put out. Yeah. Um, so this is this entire uh, upgrade has been about seven years in the making. Um, Vitalik and all the other Ethereum foundation, Ethereum founders, developers, have been talking about this type of upgrade from the beginning, even before Ethereum was launched. So they recognized coming in that there were some serious limitations with blockchain technology. Obviously, surrounding the consensus, was there an alternative to proof of work that could work better in the long term, that could be more sustainable? And their top option was proof of stake. And on the other side, is there a way to make it more scalable? As in, uh, can we create a platform where you don't have to have every node on the network uh, process every transaction. Can you make it so they only have to process part of the chain 
securely so you can have anyone run a node on the network. So these are two of crypto's biggest problems uh, from the start. And uh, Ethereum research teams have really spent, poured years into developing these mechanisms, solving for problems with proof of stake because they had some pretty fatal problems early on. Um, How can they work around those, get to a design where, hey, this might actually work? And then not only how can it actually work, now we need to put it into a platform, actually put it into a production-ready platform. And so that's why you've seen so many years of research, uh, some false starts along the way, um, finally getting to a point where you can get a real uh, a product spec in place and start building some, uh, some clients around it to actually get to that point. So that's why it's been, it's been taken from a theoretical concept into a production ready concept and doing something like that, that is really from a sense groundbreaking that just takes time. Um, So that's why it's really been a a seven year effort to get to this point. Yeah, it blows my mind that it's been taken so long before we see this first phase of Ethereum 2.0, which is just starting to launch right now. And in this report, you guys mentioned there are actually more than uh, a few phases and there's actually three components, the proof of stake part, the sharding part and the beacon chain, which will all be built out in the in these kind of subsequent phases. So can you help us outline what are these phases at a high level and how long do you think it would take them to all play out for us to have that full Ethereum 2.0 vision? Um, so yeah, the uh, so E2, E2.0 is bro- broken down into really four phases as I have it at, at the moment. Um, so just walking through each of them briefly, phase zero is the most imminent one. And that's the one um, we're looking very forward to launching, hopefully a week from tomorrow, if not very soon after. And um, that will introduce the concept of the beacon chain. And that will be a proof of stake network that is actually separate from the existing Ethereum network. And uh, that will be the first introduction that people will have to staking Ethereum on a network uh, in return for some staking rewards or yield. And it's all about building up the validator set of that network. So getting people on board, working through any of the growing pains that there may be, uh, but making sure that the, the chosen proof of stake algorithm that Ethereum has is up to speed and getting a validator set robust enough to handle some of the other upgrades further down the road. Um, the second phase, phase one, uh, we're probably looking, I've heard some early estimates saying about a year out. So you could be looking Q4, 2021, maybe early 2020, uh, sorry, 2022. And, um, that's going to be the introduction of shard chains. So when we're talking about sharding, that's, where we're going to introduce 64 individual chains, which will essentially be like copies of the network but they all plug back in and reference each other back to that beacon chain. So the beacon chain is that coordination layer for all the different chains that are out there. So that would enable them to secure, uh, like all the validators on the beacon chain would secure all the other chains. And then on top of that, um, you would, uh, not only would it secure it, it would be a a communication layer as well. So you'd be able to communicate from one shard to the next through that beacon chain. to, in it should be noted in these first two phases, phase one, phase zero, phase one, there's not going to be a whole lot of functionality. It's really just kind of coming to consensus on the beacon chain and then on the beacon chain with all the shards together in phase one. So there won't be any application functionality. You won't be able to drop any smart contracts on there. And there won't be any transactions either. It's really just uh, focusing on how you build out this architecture, which is relatively new, Uh, with this level of activity, with these number of validators on the network. Um, Where things start to get interesting is the third phase, phase 1.5, is where you see this merge of the current network with Ethereum 2.0. So we're actually going to take the state and account balances uh, from Ethereum now and transition it as a shard within the Ethereum 2.0 network. So it's going to be one of the 64 shards. And it's supposed to, from a uh, from a, an application and user standpoint, it's supposed to look pretty seamless. You're really just swapping out the proof of work layer that's building blocks right now for a proof of stake layer, and that, that that's it. So all the work is kind of like underneath on the uh, 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 underneath everything that's happening on the execution layer 
while the execution layer remains essentially the same. Um, and then the final phase after that, I know some estimates have come out that said maybe it will come around like 2023, 20, uh, but phase two could come further down the line. We're, we're not, there's no real timeline for this. And that's when each of these shards would get application execution abilities. So you would actually be able to deploy smart contracts directly onto the shard chains. And that would really unlock the scalability of what Ethereum 2.0 can bring because now instead of living on a single network, now I can live across all these different shards with various applications living on there. And then um, instead of having sort of like a, a data bottleneck on one chain, you can use whatever chain you want. Um, the one caveat that we should add in there though, is that there's a need for scalability now. And there is an option called rollups that we can get into a little bit later, but the, the short point of it is, is that you could potentially use rollups with shard chains in phase one. You could use them as like data avail availability layers. Um, and that would essentially allow you to use the access to scalability of what Ethereum 2.0 has been promising all along. And the short change of it is if these rollups plus shard chains work out, there is a chance that we may not necessarily need phase two. Um, so we could we can go into that later, but that's pretty much the high level of the phases and the potential timeline around them. That's fascinating, and I would we'll definitely go into the rollups versus sharding um, type of discussion later on. But mm -hmm. for now, it seems like there is a lot of different moving parts for Ethereum, and I know you guys mentioned different clients are working on them. So who are the people that's working on Ethereum 2.0 right now, and what are what are some of the different teams? Yeah, uh, so I, it's been pretty fascinating the uh, the effort that Ethereum Foundation has put into building out a very broad client base. Um, so right now, Ethereum has this standpoint of we want multiple clients running on the network. Why is that? Why don't we just use one client that's very, very good? Well, if you're running on a network that is a single client and say that has a bug or an issue, it's, it's, a, it's a point of centralization, really. Um, so if that goes down, the network can go down. And that's a huge issue. Whereas if you are running multiple clients that make up a good percentage of the network, you can potentially have one go down, but the network can still be operating at the same time because you have this other majority or minority client that can handle the network and continue to make blocks. Um, so... For Ethereum 2.0, Ethereum Foundation made a very strong effort to make sure they funded enough client teams going in there. So you'd have plenty of viable clients when this beacon chain launches. So right now they have four, four clients that are ready. So you can run a node on the network using each of these four, one of these four clients. Uh, the top teams right now, um, the top team is Prismatic Labs um, and their client is called Prism. Another team is um, Sigma Prime, and their client is Lighthouse. Um, there's another team called Status. And so that's, that's the same instant messaging application used on Ethereum, but they're building a, an ETH 2.0 client called Nimbus. And um, the last one that's going to be ready for mainnet is called Teku, and that's built out of um, Consensus. Uh, specifically, um, I'm forgetting the, the actual branch that's out of there, but it, it, it's being funded by consensus. So you have these four different clients that are going to be ready to run at mainnet. And um, so it, it's, it's going to give you that opportunity to run various clients so you don't have that one majority client that kind of sets up that, um, that potential for centralization in the network that gives you many different options that you can uh, you can roll in and, and, and validate on the chain. So that, I guess those are the four main client teams that you see building right now. There are some others as well that could come further down the line. And then obviously the Ethereum Foundation has been one behind a lot of the grants for these teams and behind much of the research uh, involved in all of Ethereum 2.0's phases. Yeah, it's wild to me how many people are actually working on this. I think most people looking from the outside kind of assume that there's one team, maybe the consensus guys are, are funding this, but it's obvious that there's actually multiple teams working on different parts. 
So now with this introduction out of the way, I'd love to dive into some of the meat of the report itself because there's so many different implications for Ethereum 2.0 for both other blockchains and for the existing Ethereum 1.0 and for other developers that are building dApps on it right now. So I'd love to start with this point around composability because one of Ethereum's main advantages is composability, or in other words, the ability for different apps to plug into each other. And this makes innovation happen faster because say I want to build a margin trading app, I can easily take parts of Aave, a lending protocol, and take parts of Uniswap, an exchange protocol, and hack together one relatively quickly. Now, the key concern for people seem to be that if you start splitting Ethereum into these many shards, um, as you would do in Ethereum 2.0, you will be giving up this composability that powers so many apps today. So is there any research or development in Ethereum that maybe addresses this? And either of you feel free to take this. Uh, yeah, I, I'll start and I'll, I'll let uh, Ryan chime in. So you're right. Yeah, I, as soon as if you want to go to a different shard, run your application on one of the different shards, or as we'll talk about later, going into layer two technology and may, potentially using a roll up, uh, you do break those bonds of composability, which is simply being able to reference another contract pretty much in the same transaction or, or in, the, in the same block. Um, so kind of losing that uh, composability effort is, is unfortunate. It's probably what has hindered a lot of the adoption around Layer 2 technologies today because they're, they're available. They're, 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 they're alive. They're there. But um, it's kind of tough when composability is such an important part of what, how, uh, how these uh, DeFi applications function today. So there are some potential efforts to help that, that maybe that we, that could potentially help pool liquidity across different chains to help ease any sort of transaction going between the two. So I know for one, we, we talked about is the idea of a, uh, liquidity, a decentralized liquidity network like ThorChain, where you can actually pool assets between different shards or between different, um, between a layer two and a layer one. That won't necessarily fix composability, but that can actually help uh, the transition time going from one network to the next. The uh, the other one that I I find relatively interesting is, and it came out of the uh, Reddit scaling bake off that we had over the summer, which was a competition that pretty much let uh, layer two projects uh, pitch to Reddit. Oh, here's here's our ability. Here's our pitch for scaling Ethereum, and here's why you can run uh, your Reddit community points on our network. And uh, it's a company called Connects Network, and their technology is called Space Folds, and essentially would allow two layer two networks talk to each other. Um, so that's that's potentially one thing in the works. That I don't know if it's going to be able to solve composability between different shards or layer twos now, but I, I know that's that's something that is being working on, and that's probably one of the top options as far as you know if we can get there. That's 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 probably up there as being one of the, the top options that could that could help out. Got it. And uh, anything to add there, Ryan? No, I mean I think Wilson pretty much covered. Uh, all the all the main points about uh, different solutions that are you know, coming out either to alleviate some of the so I guess you know one thing that uh, Wilson mentioned is that uh, in this kind of like roll up centric future where you have uh, most uh, applications running on roll ups and using shards as data availability availability layers uh, there will be kind of like lengthy withdrawal periods to get from a roll up back to the, the main chain. Uh, usually about, I mean, about like a week as it stands today. And in that scenario, like you will want to have, uh, you know, kind of these like cross chain, like market makers, either decentralized solutions like ThorChain or uh, centralized market makers that can kind of facilitate, uh, you know, more instant transfers. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, if you want to maintain composability, uh, you'll probably have to go to the same shard. So there might be, you know, one, you know, DeFi shard that has a couple of applications that really depend on each other for uh, composability, and for ones that uh, 
you know, you only need to use on an asynchronous basis. Uh, those will be, those, you know, can be on different rollups or just the Ethereum main chain. Got it. So it sounds like there are kind of market-based workarounds for this issue around composability um, and for kind of specific types of dApps, you could also just hang around and wait for that long um, withdrawal period, which seems to be uh, obviously suboptimal, but it does seem like there's efforts that are being worked on to address those. So that, that's, that's quite reassuring, especially as as I think a lot of the network effects for Ethereum comes from its composability. So to lose that, they need to be offering something else to replace that. Um, and on that note, I'd also love to kind of touch on the process of transition itself, because it sounds like Ethereum 2.0 is a totally different blockchain. So what would the transition process actually look like for existing applications, right? So if I were building a DeFi application right now in Ethereum 1.0, and I have to transition this to 2.0, what are the things I can expect? And what are the things that I might have to do right now? Yeah, uh, so I can start this off and then I guess Wilson can can add on. But uh, I guess the, the, the main idea is that until phase 1.5, when the ETH1 chain merges into the ETH2 chain, uh, you don't really have to do anything. Uh, the way that uh, Ethereum 2.0 was designed, or particularly that this uh, these phases were designed, was to be as minimally disruptive to the current Ethereum chain as possible. Uh, and it's kind of just out of the recognition that there are you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets on Ethereum, uh, you know, a hundred, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of transactions every day. There are uh, you know, tens of thousand applications, and you don't want to make it this disruptive process. Um, so, uh, all the all the stuff happening in, on a, the Ethereum two chain will be happening in parallel to uh, the Ethereum one chain until this merger happens. Um, so, I guess yeah. In, in the meantime, uh, nothing. And then I think you know Wilson can touch on you know, what happens during that ETH one point five, or sorry, phase one point five ETH one see through uh, merger. Yeah. Um, so actually from that standpoint of an application, when that, whenever that time does come, whether it's a year and a half, two, three years from now, um, it's supposed to look relatively seamless from an application and user standpoint. Um, so you're not going to have to do a, a big migration of your applications. You're not going to have to change the code in a, uh, in a big way or, or any way, as far as um, from what I've seen, the uh, the real main change is that, of course, you're going to have to be running a different client. So you're just going to have to change from an ETH1 client to an ETH2 client and make sure you're pointing your application to the ETH2 chain when the transition finally does happen. And um, from the standpoint that we're looking at is when the transition does happen, they would actually have to stop the chain for about an hour or maybe less, they're trying to work that time down to actually facilitate that. So just kind of recognizing that they, maybe there might be a little bit of downtime and that you have to change your client and make sure you're pointing it to the, uh, to the right chain. So really trying to minimize the effort from applications and users on that side that really just to kind of make it seamless and almost as soon as you get on the other chain, you start, maybe it's a little bit more efficient because um, because you're running on, on this new technology, there might be a little bit of a pickup on, on the new chain, but um, it's uh, the whole point about going through this process of merging into a shard is to eliminate any sort of manual effort that applications or people would have to go through to otherwise migrate from one chain to the next. Because you've seen that happen multiple times where... Um, you know, someone launches a token on one project on one chain, and then they launch their main chain elsewhere, and then they have to go through this whole token swap process. And then maybe some people don't make it over. And so they have to go back after the deadline and make sure everyone gets through. So that's a re a really trying to eliminate any sort of issues surrounding that. And this 30 second intermission is brought to you by our sponsor Nexo. Depending on what type of company you're operating, Nexo can help you in different ways. As an exchange, they can be a strategic partner. As a miner, they will offer you OTC credit lines to help cover expenses. And as a crypto fund or any type of institutional counterparties, they can offer you a portfolio of structured financial products and up to 8% annual interest on your idle stable coins, as well as asset swap agreements or direct borrowing off crypto. 
Individuals can also park their cash and stable coins at Nexo's interest earning account to get an annual rate of 8%. And what's more is that you can actually claim this interest every single day, and you can add or withdraw funds at any time as well. So if this sounds interesting to you, get started at Nexo.io. This week's episode is also brought to you by Radix. If you're interested in DeFi, Radix is a layer one protocol built specifically to serve DeFi. Radix focuses on speed, security, and scalability, and previous iterations have delivered 1 million transactions per second. They recently raised $13 million in their token sale and have launched their liquidity incentive program as well. So head on over to radixdlt.com to learn more or click the link in the descriptions below. I'd also like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Bitrex Global. As someone based outside of the US, I've always been frustrated about how hard it is to invest in companies like Tesla, Google, and Apple. Brokerage accounts have exorbitant fees and have terrible trading experiences. Fortunately, Bitrex Global is now offering tokenized stocks, which means you can invest in US stocks 24 hours a day, not just during stock market hours. You can even buy fractions of a share and manage your crypto and stock portfolio on one single exchange. I'm personally really excited about this as a user, and if you are too, sign up today for Bitrex Global using the link in the description. And as a corollary to that, it sounds like this is maybe the most opportune time for other blockchains to come and compete with Ethereum just because there's this whole transitionary process. So do you guys see any kind of threat from other blockchains currently or as an extension to that, is there an opportunity that applications that are built on Ethereum currently don't want to transition over to Ethereum 2.0 and you maybe even see a fork of this old type of Ethereum 1.0 and Ethereum 2.0? Is there a risk for that right now? So I, I, I think you have to consider the fact that you've gone through the this past DeFi summer watching transaction fees go up uh, pretty high, uh, congestion on the network reaching highs since its 2017 ICO days, that you if you're building a, uh, a competing network, there has to be a bit of an opportunity there that you should be able to gain some users, there should be some leakage out to some of these other networks. And I, I you should, there, there probably will be, um, especially if they start building copycat applications on um, these other networks, whether it be uh, Cosmos, Polkadot, Solana. And um, you should maybe also see some applications exploring other options. But I think a lot of what the applications that are built on Ethereum today, they value that composability. They value what Ethereum has has brought to their application. And so if they're going to move anywhere, I think their their most likely move is going to be up to a roll-up chain. Um, and especially ones that really feed off of each other and use each other for uh, use each other using those composability standards, that they'll probably go up to the same roll-up chain in the meantime, while you're waiting for Ethereum 2.0. So I think the real race that we're talking about is not between other chains and when Ethereum 2.0 becomes functional. It's between when do rollups start to gain adoption versus other chains. And they're on a very similar timeline right now for when uh, chains like Cosmos, Polkadot, Solana start to reach that level of maturity where they can start get, get, uh, start. Uh, allowing applications to really communicate with each other and support a good amount of development as well as, um, and the, on the other side, um, the similar timeline of maturity is with these roll-up contracts, which should be launching within the, uh, the next four to five months. So that's how I'm kind of, I'm, I'm looking at it from that standpoint. Now I don't see too many DeFi apps potentially moving chains more, just moving up a layer. Uh, but it will be interesting to see how, a lot of these other networks, maybe they, they ramp up their efforts and, and incentivization efforts to get people to start building parallel DeFi ecosystems. So it sounds like there isn't too big of a threat from other blockchains, given that uh, the the timeline for um, some of the developments you just mentioned is is to the magnitude of months and not not years. Whereas the full vision for Ethereum 2.0, that's, that's the thing that's going to take years. Is that roughly the right way to kind of summarize that? Yeah, it's 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 going to take a while to get there for the 2.0, but the rollups are going to get shorten that timeline, and then it could be even uh, even more enticing once you can combine rollups with that those phase one shards and get this level of scalability that Ethereum 2.0 has been trying to achieve for all these years. 
Um, and I, and I, I will mention on top of that, I, I think a lot of these networks that are comp- uh, like supposedly competing networks, they can be complementary in a lot of ways. And maybe there's some chains out there that end up uh, accruing users and applications that offer different types of services. So maybe it's not a, a DeFi centric network. Maybe it's more Web3 based um, or NFT gaming based and uh, they can kind of plug and play as they go along. So I, I think there's still opportunity for where these other networks can kind of carve out a niche. Um, but maybe it's slightly different than what Ethereum looks like now. Yeah, and I guess uh, one thing I would add is that this is the the kind of purpose of Vitalik's kind of roll-up centric uh, future post about Ethereum. And the idea is that kind of what Wilson said is the timeline for many of these competing blockchain uh, ecosystems to become competitive is you know very similar to uh, Ethereum with uh, shards and and rollups as far as you know when they will be able to be you know, ready for applications to start running on them. And, you know, part of this, I won't say like pivot, but this, uh, you know, embracing of uh, kind of like stopping potentially Ethereum 2.0 at phase 1.5 is that at, at that point when the ETH1 chain merges into ETH2 and you have uh, these 64 shards of data availability layers and you have rollups at that point you already get you know probably a hundred thousand transactions per second uh in which case i mean there's a scalability a scalability there and this is not something that's three years out or four years out or whoever knows with like uh phase two this is something that is potentially maybe 12 to 24 months out uh where we can get this the scalability that makes a lot of sense and i'd love to take this opportunity to pivot and talk about the economic model side of things as well, because you guys spent a significant part of the report on this. And I think in the, in the report, you guys mentioned that ETH itself will become more than just a fee token, because currently it's used to pay for gas, and that's pretty much it. But then it will also became a, become a source of security for Ethereum as Ethereum transitions to proof of stake. So as an extension to that, I'm very curious about what you guys take are on what is the impact of this on the value of ETH? Does ETH become more important and more valuable or is it not the right way to think about that? Yeah, so I think the the way to think about uh, ETH's role in Ethereum 2.0 is that ETH now becomes the most essential asset in the Ethereum ecosystem. So it's like a major upgrade to ETH as an asset. And you know, one of the reasons why you kind of touched on the idea that now you will be able to use uh, ETH to stake and participate in the consensus process, and as a result, be able to receive a yield on that ETH, uh, and it becomes really interesting. Now, probably about, I want to say three years ago, maybe four at this point, uh, Chris Berniski wrote a paper called like Ringing the Bell on a New Asset Class uh, for Bitcoin. And he cited some work by an academic named Robert Greer about the three kind of super classes of assets. And in that, they kind of identified that there's, you know, most assets or all assets can be categorized into uh, three classes, uh, stores of value, capital assets, and commodities. Uh, this is all something that, you know, the bankless guys have, have touched on as well uh, with ETH. And, you know, in ETH1, uh, ETH is like you said, primarily it's used as gas, which is kind of like a commodity. And it's also used as uh, a store of value, right? People use it as collateral and DeFi applications. You can use it to send payments to each other, uh, but that that's it. Now, in Ethereum 2.0, uh, because of the fact that you can stake ETH and get this native yield on it, well, now it has properties of a, of a capital asset, which is kind of like an income producing uh, asset. And it's really interesting because now you have these uh, these, these three properties combined uh, in one asset uh, that each create demand uh, in these in their own directions uh, for ETH, which is pretty interesting. And I think the the analogy, especially on the commodity side, will be you know, even more powerful when you combine uh, ETH 2.0 with uh, EIP 1559, which is kind of like a uh, a new proposal to restructure how users bid for block space on Ethereum that will also have the 
uh, the effect of burning the majority of uh, transaction fees. Uh, Xenip quite literally will be you know, used as like fuel for transactions because it's being burned. Um, and I think it gets really interesting at that point. And you know, I think we can dive into this as well, but there's, there's very interesting implications when you start getting into the, the monetary policy aspects of Ethereum as well, uh, when you do have these transaction burns, uh, combined with staking. Yeah, I actually wanted to touch on that because I'd imagine that this is a huge question for a lot of current ETH holders or potential investors in Ethereum or people who are just introduced to the crypto space because of this Bitcoin narrative that's going on. And now they're trying to look at other things that's happening in crypto. So with Ethereum 2.0, as you said, people will start to earn a yield from the inflation of the Ethereum supply by staking. So it's not just the miners earning new ETH now. Anyone can basically stake their ETH tokens and earn more ETH. So will there be a new monetary policy for Ethereum? And how does it differ from what we have today? And what are the main type of considerations there? Yeah, so Ethereum's monetary policy can be defined as minimum necessary issuance. And the idea with this is that Ethereum will always aim to issue enough ETH to ensure that the Ethereum blockchain stays secure. Now, this is something that uh, probably to many will sound very kind of abstract and technocratic and kind of hard to define. Uh, but in practice, uh, it's actually worked out quite well uh, for Ethereum. I mean, there's only been uh, two times in Ethereum's history where the monetary, uh, where issuance has changed, and each time it was to lower the issuance down uh, to what, what is actually necessary. Uh, and kind of like the, the philosophy underpinning this monetary policy is that what Ethereum is optimizing for is security. And this is a, uh, a, a difference in philosophy from Bitcoin, which is not optimizing for security, but is op optimizing for uh, you know, this kind of like monetary idealism of a fixed supply currency with a deterministic and uh, fixed and predictable schedule. Uh, so they each have their own trade-offs. You know, on one hand, like I said, with you know, Ethereum, while you do ensure that it's always secure, uh, the monetary policy is, uh, you know, a little bit harder for people to kind of grasp because of the fact that, you know, who gets to decide what minimum, minimum necessary issuance is, and it's kind of like hard to quantify. And then the other side with, uh, you know, Bitcoin's monetary policy is that, like, yes, you kind of get this, uh, you know, ideal money that's fixed supply, but uh, as a as a consequence, you kind of set the security budget uh, arbitrarily. Uh, because you just say, hey, we're just going to issue this amount of Bitcoin every year. It's going to have every four years. And uh, eventually there's going to be a fee market that supports the, the, the security of the network. And like, who knows that works, right? Uh, so that's a difference in philosophy. Now, now, how that actually translates into Ethereum's monetary policy for Ethereum 2.0, well, in the beginning of, you know, at phase zero, which, you know, hopefully is, you know, December 1st, you know, a week from now, uh, it looks like it will be uh, at the current deposit rates. Uh, all the issuance on the Ethereum 2.0 chain will be incremental to what's already on the Ethereum 1.0 chain. So to put some numbers behind that, uh, right currently, Ethereum is, uh, you know, the annual inflation rate is about 3.8, 3.9%. And then depending on how much ETH is, is staked on, uh, the E2 ch be beacon chain, that incremental issuance could be anywhere from you know 0.10% to 0.80% in the most aggressive case where you have you know 20 million people or 20 million uh, ETH staking. Uh, so combined, you're talking about you know uh, probably like a 4% to a 5% annual issuance rate for Ethereum until the merger happens and. Uh, ETH1 is is, is uh, consumed into, into ETH2. So for the next maybe one and a half years until that happens, when we do get the merger, uh, Ethereum's issuance rate will actually increase. Now, where it gets interesting is when that merger does happen uh, in phase 1.5. So like I said, hopefully a year and a half from now. And where that's interesting is because the once incremental issuance from the beacon chain which, I, like I said, could be anywhere from you know 
10% or 0.10% to 0.80%, uh, that now becomes the only issuance. And so now you're talking about Ethereum's uh, annual inflation rate, you know, being, you know, probably, you know, well, probably, or I would almost say definitely below 1%, um, probably closer to like, you know, 0.5%. Uh, and that would be sustainable. And then uh, probably, you know, another significant factor that affects this annual issuance rate is also the, you know, existence of EIP-1559, uh, kind of like I talked about before. And the idea with that is that that will actually offset some of the annual issuance uh, with the amount of ETH that's burned on a daily basis. And to put some numbers behind that, well, if you think about it, um, when there's 20 million ETH staked on the beacon chain, uh, Ethereum will be issuing about 2,000 ETH a day. Uh, over the course of 2020, uh, on a you know uh, an, an average day for Ethereum, about 2,000 ETH in transaction fees were paid every day. So you know if Ethereum 2.0 were to exist right now and transaction fees were uh, what they are today, uh, Ethereum's annual issuance would be uh, net annual issuance would be basically zero. So there's a chance even that depending on how high transaction fees get in Ethereum 2.0, that you could actually have Ethereum's uh, net issuance actually go negative. Now, of course, the key you know, caveat here with uh, the transaction fees is that, well, you know, one of the major benefits of Ethereum 2.0 is that you get more scalability and hopefully with more scalability, that means transaction fees are lower, right? Because I mean, one of the, the key uh, purposes of scalability is not just to keep uh, it's not just to you know allow the Ethereum blockchain to process more transactions per second, but also to keep it accessible to everyday users and keep transaction fees low. So you know there there definitely is you know a chance that transaction fees aren't nearly as high on Ethereum 2.0, and you know this burn isn't as big as it would be, uh, you know using the transaction fees that Ethereum was bur uh, potentially burning over the summer. Uh, but you know the long story is that. Ethereum's annual issuance rate will be, you know, probably very low at Ethereum 2.0. And this could be happening, you know, very soon within the next maybe, you know, one and a half years. And at that point, I mean, you're talking about, let's, let's, let's say like a, a 0.5% annual inflation rate. Uh, that would be, you know, a percent below Bitcoin at that point. So Bitcoin, you know, over the next four years until it's next having uh, its annual issuance rate will be about 1.8%. Um, so you're talking... You know, significantly below Bitcoin. Uh, you know, once the ETH one chain gets merged into ETH two. Wow, that's fascinating. So it sounds like the usage of Ethereum, which in, in, in turn affects the gas fees, will actually affect the monetary policy. And there's is a possibility for Ethereum to become a deflationary asset if it's used enough. Exactly, and and I think that's what makes it uh, perhaps most interesting because. It's like, yes, you have this asset that is now deflationary. Um, one, because of the fact that with proof of stake, you can actually lower the amount of issuance that you're providing to uh, you know, people securing the network. Uh, two, because you have these uh, transaction fees that are being burned. Uh, and now three, you know, you add in uh, staking and the ability to earn you know, yield on Ethereum. Uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a very interesting asset. You have this like really deflationary kind of monetary asset uh, that's also kind of used as commodity that you can also use to generate some yield on. And I, I don't think there's any been. I mean, I, I hesitate to say <laughs> that it's unprecedented, but I don't think there's been anything quite like um, you know ETH, uh, at least how how it, how it will exist in Ethereum 2.0. And uh, I'll, I'll just adding on to that, I think uh, what when Ryan was talking about um, the way he laid it out, the different narratives and how it's very easy to grok Bitcoin as being this fixed asset um, and, or has, has, has a lower inflation rate, fixed supply, and it might be a little more difficult to really understand Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum's uh, minimum necessary issuance. But as soon as it kind of turns into either a very low issuance or potentially deflationary asset, that becomes a much stronger narrative. And whether we want to, you know, buy into them or not, narratives can be very, very strong. So that just kind of even even helps Ethereum's story even more 
when this switch finally happens. That's definitely a great point. I know firsthand how how much people pay attention to narratives within crypto. So that's that's going to be interesting to see play out. And I know you guys touched on the idea of the amount staked right now. Uh, and you guys mentioned that it's very possible that we might see the first phases of Ethereum starting next week. So just as we come to the final parts of the interview, can you give us an update about what is happening latest on Ethereum 2.0 currently? You know, what are the things that we can do today to help push this forward? Yeah. Um, so right now we are in the pre-launch phase, I guess you can call it. Um, so this contract, the deposit contract is live. If you want to send ETH to it and claim it on the new network, uh, you would actually become a staker and a validator on there. Um, obviously the downside is you'll be, have your funds locked in there until phase 1.5. There are some remedies around that, that I'm, uh, I'll hand it off to Ryan that he can get into, but, um, that would enable you to stake on the network. So phase zero, all about staking. If you want to send your assets to this deposit contract, um, you'll be able to be a staker on the network. And if it's right now, you'll be, get, be able to be a staker from Genesis. Um, so what this means is there's a minimum amount of Ethereum that it takes to launch this new chain. So they're requiring 524,288 ETH. Uh, that's equal to about 16,000 um, 300 something validators on the network to, to launch the chain. And that's to just give it enough validators or enough security at launch that would make them feel comfortable. Um, and so right now we're looking at, I, th I believe the latest, I, che I checked it not too long ago. I think we were about 80% or a little over 80% of the way there. Uh, so there's a remaining 20% of the necessary locked up ETH that would take to launch this chain. Um, so that uh, minimum necessary issuance, or minimum, I'm sorry, minimum necessary state is one parameter. The other one is the minimum Genesis date, which is set right now for December 1st. Um, so one thing about the uh, reaching that minimum launch uh, or minimum ETH stake to launch, uh, it, there's a seven day delay from when that's reached to when the chain can launch. Um, so for us to, for ETH 2.0 or the Beacon Chain to launch on December 1st, it has to be reached. That minimum amount of ETH stake needs to be reached by tomorrow. Uh, so November 24th, that would give us seven days to December 1st. I think there is a, a very strong chance that will happen, seeing how rapidly that amount of uh, staked ETH is going up as of late. Um, but if it doesn't, so if it doesn't get hit by tomorrow, um, then it will just start rolling over. So if it gets, if that minimum staked amount gets hit on Wednesday, uh, the 25th, then we'll see the beacon chain launched on the second. Um, and that'll just keep rolling over until we finally reach that, that minimum required amount. Um, and then after that's just the stake at Genesis. And then afterwards you can, uh, obviously be a part of the staker at any point between when the chain launches and, uh, from there on out. Um, so if you want to be a staker and you kind of, and, and you have a long-term investment horizon, on, on ETH, so you're looking to hold this thing for the next five to ten years, it and and you're pretty low risk in your uh, in your thought process, um, so you don't want to get involved with the next unaudited DeFi application or or you know put put your assets in in, in the pickle jar. Um, it, it, it st staking might be a uh, an option for you, so you get a nice uh, you you get a pretty. It's going to be variable, but you you'll know you'll get some return if you run, um, if you use a good validating service, or if you know that you're going to have a good amount of uptime that you you won't lose money. You'll most likely get, uh, gain some sort of uh, you'll 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 be able to make money. Some fit. instead of holding it, you'll you'll actually be able to uh, obtain some sort of yield over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was going to say, yeah, kind of like Boston said, the uh, the easiest thing people can do to help take this over the line would be to, you know, to simply deposit ETH into the contract. Um, but I think one hesitancy, and we can actually touch on this as well, um, that, that people have is that, uh, is the illiquidity. So uh, when you deposit your ETH into deposit contract to stake, uh, your ETH will be locked up until 
the ETH1 chain merges into ETH2, uh, into the ETH2 chain. And while estimates are that that could be anywhere from, let's say, 12 to 36 months, I mean, practically speaking, you're locking up your ETH uh, indefinitely. So there have been uh, you know, some solutions that have come out already that allow people to get liquidity on their ETH. So one example would be a state, uh, or, or sorry, liquid stake uh, by, by Andrew Keys. And basically what they allow you to do is if you uh, stake through, through liquid stake, uh, they will allow you to borrow USDC against your, your ETH so you can get some liquidity. Uh, and then kind of like another category of, I guess, liquidity solutions that, uh, although uh, are very early right now, but will probably be very uh, fully fleshed out in the coming months are uh, ETH derivatives. And those could be uh, ETH derivatives issued by exchanges, by staking and service providers, by decentralized staking protocols. But you know, the main idea is that you'll be able to uh, stake your ETH through one of these uh, providers or protocols. They will issue you a, an ETH derivative that will be a claim on the underlying ETH. And then you can use that ETH derivative um, you know, as if it's any other asset on Ethereum, right? So you know, in theory, you know, MakerDAO could, uh, could integrate this derivative ETH and you can borrow against it, same thing with Compound, uh, can provide liquidity in Uniswap, uh, et cetera. So that's probably the most uh, exciting of the liquidity solutions. But you know, like I said, um, you know, haven't seen a, a, a full-blown solution uh, that's live right now, although they are coming you know, shortly. Yeah, and I have my theories about just how this ETH derivative might trade. I think there might be some sort of a discount or premium, depending on how you think about it. But that's definitely scope for another whole discussion. So... I would like to, first of all, say thank you so much for you guys for coming onto this show. This has been a true delight to talk to you guys. And obviously, I follow you guys and your work. But for those of us who haven't started following you yet, I'll give you a chance here to kind of plug your own channels. What are the best ways to keep up to date with what you guys are working on? Yeah. So I guess both Wilson and I uh, write on a weekly basis for Masari. So you can catch us at masari.io. Uh, and then uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So you can catch me at Ryan Watkins underscore on Twitter. And yeah, yeah tweet every day. Uh, yeah. So like you said, Masari.io, best place to, to see my stuff. Uh, the, uh, on Twitter, I'm at Wilson with you. I, I'm not as active, working, work my way there. But uh, definitely, <laughs> uh, definitely tune in to everything that's going on. I retweet a lot. So yeah. Um, but I, I, I reach out anytime. I think uh, it's great to connect with a lot of people that are uh, that are new or have been around in the, a while in this industry. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, guys, for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks so much, Jason. This is a lot of fun.